Hi everyone, welcome back to Storytime Recaps. In this video, I'm going to recap one of the film from 2021, Love, Death, and Robot, The Drowned Giant. Without any further, let's get started. The episode opens with three scientists going to a beach as one of them, Stephen, tells a story about a nude dead giant. The day before, a massive storm had hit the sea which washed up a dead body of a giant to the shore. The shocked local fishermen got in touch with the officials, who initially didn't think such horrible news could be true. However, as people started going to the beach and coming home with strange stories, the scientists made the decision to investigate. Stephen and his associates, believing that everyone was merely playing up about the deceased giant, now find themselves in front of him. The body is surrounded by people who are initially afraid to touch it until they are positive it is safe. Stephen's co-workers estimate the man's weight to be about 80 tons. According to Stephen, they have a hard time determining his age because of the majority of his features, but based on the giant's well-defined mouth and nose, he thinks that the man was once a young man with a mild attitude. The trio examines the giant by going over his entire physique. Stephen notices a small pool of water where tiny fish are swimming that was gathered in the corpse's pond. Scale, of course. Beyond his enormous stature, Stephen claims that what surprises him most about the monster is just that he exists. He draws a comparison between the giant's existence and the beach crowd and comes to the conclusion that they are just little replicas because. of him. Stephen becomes fascinated with the creature as his colleague climbs the corpse's chest and gestures to the crowd that it is okay to approach. Cheering, the crowd runs toward him and climbs to the top. A few of them mention how bouncy and springy the body is. Little ones begin to play on his chest, damaging it with their shoes. Stephen, on the other hand, stays at the giant from a distance as he and his colleagues write down their notes without touching or climbing on it. After some time, the villagers decide they've had enough of playing with the dead giant and head back home. After three days, Stephen returns to the beach because of his developing interest in it and his institution gives him the responsibility of watching the huge creature. He says he wasn't morbid about watching a dead person because the giant seemed more alive to Stephen than the people around him. He observes the children playing slide on his chest while some workmen prepare to butcher the corpse's femur bone. For the following day, Stephen even purposefully delayed his trip to the beach planning to arrive late in the afternoon when nobody would be afternoon. there. When he arrives, the corpse appears to be in poor shape and has begun to decay. A teenage girl sits comfortably on the giant's ear, using it as a chair. Stephen observes that the giant's face no longer looks as young as it once did. He believes that is the result of tissue taxion and extended submersion in seawater. A crab emerges from the giant's mouth, and the scientist predicts that his complete decomposition won't take long. When Stephen musters the guts to approach the corpse, he discovers a constructed sandcastle atop its chest. Then, his second arm appears, revealing to us that the people have already removed what is left of it after half of it has already decomposed. Meanwhile, his cornea has clouded over and gotten fuzzy, giving his eyes a vortex-like appearance. As he looks at them, Stephen remarks that the loneliness the giant is experiencing is more heartbreaking than his misery. When he returns to see the giant, one of his legs and both of his arms have been severed and decomposed. As Stephen moves around, he observes the corpse that teenagers had defaced by spray painting profanities all over his body. He finds it difficult to see the magnificent creature come to an end, but the insults make him feel that the creature is more human because it seems more vulnerable to him now. The next day, Stephen returns to the shore and is almost relieved to see that the corpse's head has been cut off and that birds are eating its flesh while he watches. The corpse appeared less human without the head, which lessened Stephen's bond with the creation he had made. He doesn't return to the shore for a few weeks after that day, and on his next journey, he notices that all features that would have indicated the corpse was previously human have disappeared. The once magnificent creature's rotting stomach is all that's left. The crowd's fascination with the gigantic had worn off by now. Several months later, when nobody remembers the giant's appearance, numerous body parts are seen in the village, especially his bones, which are used as decorations. One day when riding a bike, Stephen finds the giant's abandoned skull. He thinks he might find mummified ears and noses if he searches the town's pubs. 
Stephen feels that these ornaments do a better job of capturing the giant's greatness than his swollen, rotting limbs ever could. Regarding the giant's genitalia, it is revealed that they were cut off and shown in a circus at the Freak Museum. According to Stephen, the equipment is so large that it takes up an entire tent, but it is tragically mislabeled as being part of a whale. whale. At end, the scientist adds that the people who saw the giant remember him simply as a sea monster. But for him, the giant is still alive, and he frequently has dreams about being raised from the dead. In these dreams, the giant walks through the town, gathering up the pieces of himself to return to the sea. Thanks for watching, and remember to turn on your notifications to watch more movie recaps like this one.